The views reflected by any of the guests may not reflect the views of the podcast host. Some topics may be difficult for some listeners. Proceed at your own risk. This podcast does not replace psychotherapy or advice and is for entertainment purposes only. Today, I'm so happy to speak with Dr. Debbie Joffe Ellis. This is a fabulous episode. I really loved it. We dive into the concepts of rational emotive behavior therapy. Here, she breaks down the concepts for us from the first floor to the very top and describes its influence on hope and resilience. We talk about this holistic cognitive therapy and how to practice it daily. We dive into concepts such as rational optimism and how one should also practice gratitude daily to help us get through hard times and build our resilience. Welcome to Apology, Stories of Hope, Healing, and Resilience. I'm your host, Christina McKelvey. Today, I'm so pleased to introduce to you Dr. Debbie Joffe Ellis. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Happy to be with you, Christina. Thank you. And I, are you on the East Coast right now, or are you? where are you in the world? I'm here, there, and everywhere, depending <laughs> on what podcast you're listening to. <laughs> no, um, my tush is, is sitting on a chair in New York City. Oh, it's probably a little colder there than here. In a, you're in Arizona? I am, mm-hmm. but northern Arizona, so it's not Phoenix or Tucson. Yeah, and the weather is not like New York City, you are correct. It's cold, but warm in energy and vigor. <laughs> there we go. So let's dive a little bit into REBT. And just before we kind of pick that apart and how it relates to hope and healing and resilience, because that is what my podcast is about, for our listeners who are not therapists, maybe give a little background on what REBT is. Sure. Well, REBT, in other words, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, is the pioneering cognitive approach in psychotherapy. It was the first approach to holistically and majorly challenge the then in the in the um, 20th century lord of the psychotherapy universe, Dr. Sigmund Freud, to challenge his approach. And my late husband, as you mentioned earlier, or it might have been when we were in private conversation before recording, um, Dr. Albert Ellis created REBT. He was trained to be a psychoanalyst because in those days, and we're talking about the 1940s, Mm -hmm. he was a lot older than me, by the way, Um, hence my youthful voice, glow and appearance. Well, I was wondering if that's why or if you had like the secret to youth and longevity. I don't know. Well, it's not a secret, but I think one of the keys to youthfulness and longevity is a healthy attitude following principles akin to REBTs, which Mm -hmm. I'm about to share with you, Mm -hmm. humor, and realistic optimism, which also is at the heart of REBT. I think when we have that healthy attitude and be mindful of um, creating balance in life, not fanatically, but generally eating mindfully, healthy foods, nothing wrong with a splurge now and then, but it amazes me uh, the number of people I come across who don't connect the health of their body with the food they eat. It, it's kind of astonishing. Mm-hmm. And they're not you know, unintelligent people, the ones I'm referring to. Anyway, so, um, and he was nearly 50 years older than me. So, you know, there's that too. Um, Because, yeah, he would have been, well, well into his 100 and something by now. Anyway, so he was an excellent psychoanalyst in those days, as I started to say before I digressed, um, 
if you wanted to be a psychologist, your choice really was to be a psychoanalyst. Sure, mm -hmm. the early stages and days of behaviorism were there, but uh, really, Sigmund Freud ruled the roost. And so my husband was doing psychoanalysis with his clients or patients, they were called, and um, very good at it, but he felt very dissatisfied because he noticed that after sessions, many of his patients felt better, mm. but they weren't getting better. You know, they felt better. Maybe they got some insight, they had vented, they'd expressed and so forth, but they were continuing to think in the same ways that created or contributed to their emotional distress. So bit by bit, my husband became more active directive rather than a passive therapist, which is what the classic psychoanalytic therapist is. He became more active. He would um, educate, talk about the fact that it's not what happens that creates our emotions, but our attitude to it, our perception of it, what we think about it. Mm -hmm. So his goal was to help as many people as possible to suffer less unnecessary emotional distress and to give them the simple how-tos of doing so. And so part of that was the psychoeducation, not in psychoanalysis, and homework activities between sessions, not in psychoanalysis. And so bit by bit, and then he wrote some articles and they were it took a while for them to be approved and published because it was so radical. And in fact, yeah. when he first presented his approach at the American Psychological Association Convention 1956, mm -hmm. he was booed and, and jeered and made fun of and called simplistic and stupid. The majority of his peers, actually all of them, were into the psychoanalytic field. But he persisted, he persisted, and over time, thousands and thousands of therapists either incorporated or became more fully REBT therapists. 15 years after REBT, CBT emerged. Now, Dr. Aaron Beck, known as the father of CBT, yes. um, first co contacted my late husband, um, years before he published uh, anything on CBT, at, before CBT was even CBT. And my husband was his uh, mentor and a great help to him. Mm. And a lot of the principles of CBT are those of REBT. And so essentially REBT is not only an effective evidence-based psychotherapeutic approach, it's a way of life. A way of life okay those yeah. of us who use it as such and um if you want me to christina i'm happy to do a, an elevator version of the main principles of it yes please okay well here's the elevator version of a very tall building uh, <laughs> <in my head. laughs> all right <laughs> um one might hear those of you who've read uh, stoic philosophy influence of the stoics and eastern philosophy so my husband had a number of influences but he also was uh, a visionary and literally a genius and created much that was original and that changed the world of psychology so the first main principle and and with with um, acknowledgement of Epictetus and the Stoic philosophers. It's not what happens. It's not an event. It's not what someone says. It's not anything outside of us that creates our emotional experience, but what we tell ourselves about it. Then mm -hmm. when we think in healthy, rational ways about adversity, about something unpleasant, something brutal, something we don't want, um, not getting what we do want. When we think in rational ways, we create what REBT calls healthy negative emotions. Now, negative in this sense doesn't mean bad. Mm. It's just not that pleasant. And when we think in irrational ways, we create what REBT calls the unhealthy negative emotions. Now, that's another one of the brilliant contributions of REBT that isn't seen in most, if not all, of the other psychotherapies, which have the distinguishing between the 
negative and the positive emotions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But REBT was the first and probably still is the only approach mm -hmm. to under the umbrella of negative. Educate us about the difference between the healthy and unhealthy negative. And here they are. So when we think in irrational ways, mm -hmm. I'll describe what's irrational, what's rational in a moment. And we're, we're coming up to the 36th floor. We'll get there. But right. <laughs> That's okay. Um, we have time. <laughs> oh, lovely. So um, the health, the unhealthy negative emotions include hopelessness, mm -hmm. despondency, depression, anxiety, extreme panic, fear, rage, guilt, and shame. And we, we think in rational ways about the same events then instead of hopelessness and depression, we create healthy sadness, disappointment, grief. They're healthy, they're enriching. Grief can ache, can be painful in its early stages, but so it is. Yeah. If a person doesn't say, I shouldn't be feeling this, it's awful, they will allow it as part of this tapestry of life. And if we're healthy enough and don't suffer from a pathology, we can experience emotion. It, it would be pathological not to. Mm -hmm. So sadness and disappointment can motivate us. Okay, I didn't get what I wanted. What can I learn from this? What had I better not do again? What had I better try this time? So they're healthy in either enriching our spirit, you know, grief is the other side of our deep love and gratitude for that or whom we've lost. You can't have one without the other. Unlikely. Yeah. 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 It's a song like that. Yeah. Can't have one without the other. Um, <laughs> I was dancing there. Yeah. And you did that very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, you know, growing up, um, you know, I always think about when a child's crying, so it's like, don't cry, be happy, be happy. But oh, that's the wrong message. It's a harmful message. Mm -hmm. You know, big boys don't cry. So fast forward, men out of touch with their emotions or suppressing emotions, suppress, suppress, and then out they'll rush like a volcano. Mm -hmm. and it's great. You don't want to be near them. Men or women, yeah, or in yeah. whatever gender, yeah. Yeah, so healthy, um, these healthy negative emotions. Right, right. So um, then when we think in rational ways, instead of anxiety, we create concern. Mm. REBT isn't about creating some neutral kind of peace and love all is well, neutral zone. No, concern, it's motivating. Oh, I've, I'm a student, I've got a pay-per-view due in in a week I better get up, up and 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 make a plan and and so concern pushes me drives me whereas if I'm anxious oh no, no, no either I'll procrastinate to avoid I'll put it off I'll get an extension of putting it off or I'll I'll um, find excuses not to do it mm. or I'll do it and do a very uh, lousy job of it because it's under strain and stress so a concern is the healthy counterpart to anxiety instead of rage when we think in healthy ways we create what REBT calls healthy anger what's that mm. REBT is holistic and humanistic and there's an assumption that if a human being isn't disturbed endogenously biologically then there's the tendency to be in touch with our moral compass and so healthy anger is that emotion that is created and registers when we witness or receive brutal or immoral or unethical behavior but we're still in control. We don't react. We're not impulsive. The emotion registers and we calculate what now? Do I run for the hills? Do I, do I call the police? Do I calmly pause and then express something to the person? So we're in control of our actions and response. And... Um, which healthy person would not want to be in contact with their moral compass? Yeah. Mm, yeah. 
then when we think in healthy, rational ways about the same adversity or disappoint or bad happening, instead of guilt and shame, which often are there when people attempt suicide, that feeling of worthlessness and undeservingness, what we create, the healthy counterpart, is regret. Mm. Regret, another one connected to our moral compass and we're willing to own. I did bad. I did badly. That was a mistake. I really regret doing that. But then along with that, REBT guides us to remind ourselves that I'm a fallible human. Yeah. Be human is to be likely to, to make an error. I'm still alive. If let me try if possible to make amends. Sometimes it's not possible. Let's say whatever person we intentionally or unintentionally did a bad thing towards is dead or, mm-hmm. or just cut us off and we can't make amends with them. We can still work on unconditionally accepting ourselves, not what we did. So with regret, we we take responsibility and that increases the pr- probability that we won't repeat the same error. And if we're lucky enough, we can make amends. And so um, I hope that's clear, the difference between the healthy and unhealthy negative emotions. And I think one of the greatest tragedies of humankind is that so many of us have not been taught that it's not our events, but we, we who have the power to create our own emotional destinies. Mm, and that's by differentiating between those negative emotions. You know, like you said, anxiety, but turning that into that motivation and concern. Yeah. 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 And so the how-to is recognizing the difference between irrational and rational thinking, mm. noticing when we're thinking irrationally, which is the cause of the unhealthy emotions, disputing the irrational beliefs, which results in us coming up with a rational belief and then repeating it, repeating it many times for at least 30 days so that it new neural pathways are formed and that can start to become our habitual way of thinking. Would you like me to to describe now the difference between irrational and rational? Yes, please. That'd be helpful. And then, you know, I definitely want to also really dive into how this could, oh, dive into how RBT can help with that hope and, you know, and healing. But yes, I think that might be important for our listeners to know between the rational and irrational. With pleasure. And, And I encourage listeners as I describe the elements of irrational thinking to consider which of those ways of thinking they carry out, they think, and is it helping them or hurting them? And if they acknowledge in all probability it's not helping and is helping and is creating emotional distress, then the good news is the REBT toolkit um, provides really easy to do ways of addressing and changing those irrational thoughts. And and, uh, I think you may mention later on the self-care sheet that's through that framework of how we can dispute and replace the irrational beliefs. So really quickly, when we think in irrational ways, We have demands, we have shoulds and oughts and musts, very rigid thinking. And common core irrational beliefs that many people have adopted and they don't think about their thinking, never question the the validity of them. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like to them it's, it's truth, but it's not. And so they include I must do well and be loved, liked, approved of by everyone. Mm -hmm. The second one is you, and you can be an individual or a small group, a family or a community or a religion 
or a country or a political party. And it's you, singular Paul, must believe what I believe, must act the way I think you should. I mean, that way of thinking is at the core of terrorism and wars. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the next one is life should, uh, should, must, should be fair and with justice. Now, of course, REBT, which is humanistic, encourages us to strive to make the world more fair and just, but it's based in reality. And where does it get a person to say it should be fair and just when at this time the reality is it's not? So I desire it to be, I will work to contribute to it being healthy, yeah, but it should leads to rage or hopelessness. And, and another one of those core irrational beliefs is the need for certainty. I must know for sure, dot, 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 fill in the dots, you know, will my partner treat me well forever? Will COVID ever end? I must know, I must know with certainty. And truly at this stage, the only thing that's certain that I can think of is death. Not even taxes, because some people don't even pay taxes. <laughs> yeah. So this so, leaves room for, you know, because the should and the certainty, like it's very black and white. It doesn't leave any room for nuance. It doesn't leave any room for that, like you said, holistic outlook. Exactly. Yeah. And mm. furthermore, we catastrophize, we awfulize, we blow things out of perspective. This is the worst that it could be. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. frankly, if a person is alive and they're not suffering in terrible pain 24-7, it's not the worst that it could be. And where there's life, there usually is hope that things get better. There's a lot of evidence for that. Um, and so we overgeneralize when we think in irrational ways. We think in absolute, as, as you indicate, black or white, this or that terms, all or nothing, always, never. And we damn ourselves and others and life when things don't go the way we say, think they should. And in contrast, when we think in rational ways, which will create healthy emotions in response to the same activating event, instead of the... Um, demands we have preferences i wish i want i desire it's healthy to have those goals and wants and and not to escalate them to the shoulds which will create emotional suffering if we don't get what we say we should if we don't get what we wish for we'll be healthfully sad and disappointed mm -hmm. but not devastated or debilitated yeah there's and room we, for hope there's room for hope, yes. Mm. Now, when we think in rational ways, we don't catastrophize, we don't awfulize, we don't overgeneralize, we have humor, we think keep things in perspective, we have high frustration tolerance, we can stand what we don't like, we just don't like it. I forgot to mention when we think irrationally, we have low frustration tolerance. I must have what I want when I want it, little baby that I am. So in rational thinking, we, we remind ourselves, I can stand what I don't like. I just mm. don't like it. That's not funny. And one of the very essential elements of rational thinking and REBT is the choice, and it's an effort sometimes, now often, to create unconditional self-acceptance, unconditional other acceptance, and unconditional life acceptance doesn't mean we accept bad behavior. Right. But we accept the person doing the bad behavior has worth. Their behavior may deserve consequences. And let's let's do the best we can to see mm -hmm. that that happens. But the evil doer was once a baby too. And if not for our genetic makeup and upbringing there, but for the grace of whatever you believe in, go I. So it invites the possibility at best of forgiveness and at next best, less best, but it's best best of not harboring hatred and bitterness for the rest of our lives, which will kill us. 
sooner than we would have died otherwise in all probability. It's a lot of medical research supporting that. REBT encourages daily gratitude. It reminds us to create and maintain healthy emotions, requires ongoing effort. It's a, not a one-off aha Oprah moment. It's That's the beginning and now I carry it on. Um, so there are the essentials and I think we've reached the penthouse of the tall building. We are up at the top with the view, the view of- Oh, home. it's gorgeous. <laughs> mentioned before is that it creates acceptance you know the acceptance of the other you don't have to like what they're doing but accepting the human not accepting the behavior but accepting the human and that can really shift someone's perspective like you said where that bitterness and anger kind of dissipates and you see them as they were once as a baby that humanistic approach indeed yeah yeah mm. I can see that helping with resilience, being able to move forward, you know, in whatever circumstance you're in. Most definitely. Yeah. You know, and with unconditional life acceptance, a lot of people who create either rage or hopelessness and depression, and so I mean any and all of the unhealthy negative emotions, um, in all likelihood do not have unconditional life acceptance. They will tend to focus on, look at this horrific situation and that's their dominant focus. And REBT is not about putting one's head in the sand and avoiding, suppressing, denying, not at all. But it's about choosing. And again, we have choice when we know we have choice, eh? Um, to, yes, be aware of that brutal situation, do what we can to make it better if we can, accept at this moment I can't help make it better if at that moment we can't. But not instead of, in addition to, to remember just because this element of life right now is horrific, doesn't mean all of life is horrific. And therein lies the the gift of daily gratitude. Yes, this is going on, but there's also this, and I can also experience that. And I'm grateful to have my my loved one or my my doggy or my my putty cats or who, you know, and, and I can see, hear, walk. If I can't see, I can hear can't see or hear at least I can taste and if I can't you know if if I'm able if anyone's able to comprehend what I'm saying we have a lot of blessings in our lives so it's unconditional life acceptance to to go back to how you started um, me on this kind of monologue here is um, resilience and hope definitely uh, bolstered when we make the daily effort to accept the things we can't change, change what we can, if not globally, locally, and um, work on unconditionally unconditionally accepting other people and ourselves. Mm. You know, so many of the people I've met, teach or work with have no trouble adoring their partner if they have a partner or best friend if they have a best friend or dog or cat Mm -hmm. and if the dog or cat were to poop on their very expensive new carpet they would hate that they did that but they don't love the dog or cat any less they have unconditional acceptance of the dog cat or person (laughs) Mm -hmm. um hopefully the person didn't I was just gonna say that would be unfortunate (laughs) That would if well, there are two, you know, a one two year old that has happened. <laughs> yeah, and, and a 91, 92 year old in, in worst case, but or in between, you know, life is funny sometimes and humor yeah. is great. Yes. But um the the fact that a person, you know, I've met a lot of these people who 
without effort, unconditionally accept others, even if others and more human do some unpleasant things and yet find it torturously difficult because they've not been taught how to or encouraged to do so or been given really nasty lessons from childhood onwards. You're a waste. I wish you never were born. You're, you know, mm -hmm. and the little child is sponge-like and they grow up and if they're not lucky enough to have come across uh, a redeeming situation, person, book, um, they will uh, not internalize that. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, unconditional acceptance is key to a healthy life mentally, emotionally, and physically. There are many articles in the American Journal, the, mm -hmm. the Journal of the American Medical Association. That's about as scientific a journal as you can get. Mm -hmm. that demonstrates scientifically. It's not spiritual, philosophical journal. It's here are the medical, biological, chemical facts that daily gratitude enhances the health of people with, for example, cardiovascular issues. Daily gratitude. Um, there was a long-term study done of people who had similar cardiovascular issues and half of them practiced daily gratitude and half didn't. And this to me was astonishing that the, the Individuals, the majority of them who practice daily gratitude, lived on average 15 years mm. longer than the ones who didn't. And, and also in the JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, article about showing how people with chronic anger um, have hardened arteries, high, high blood pressure, um, re, uh, lower uh, an ineffective or less effective immune system, not talking about the occasional angry outburst. Let none right. of you get paranoid now. Talking about chronic, seething, 24-7 anger, that's what we're talking about. So the mind-body connection cannot be ignored or disputed. There's so much medical evidence for that. Healthy mind, healthy emotions, healthier body. And even if we're genetically predisposed to certain conditions, research has shown people who have healthy attitudes are less likely to manifest that illness or, or condition to which we're genetically predisposed. We can change our genetic makeup. Mm. That's that holistic approach. The mind and body are connected. Speak more to that because I know, you know, you also, you're, you're, you know, you have a doctorate in alternative medicine and REBT is also a holistic therapeutic approach. So I guess my question is kind of general, but, you know, speak more about that holistic aspect to RB, REBT, but also that mind body connection that can happen and how that facilitates longevity, but also emotional growth, physical growth? Yeah. Well, I, I invite each of your listeners to consider um, how, in a positive or negative way, their emotions have helped or hurt them. Mm -hmm. And to consider how they might have felt emotionally after eating a meal that was um, over the top and clearly not good for them or their, their digestive system. You know, we have evidence if we just think about not only our thinking, but how do I feel, how did I feel when, dot, dot, dot. REBT reminds us of the inseparable interplay of our thinking and our emotions and our behavior. And the, the interplay and energy created by that scientifically, energetically influences the immune system and the health of the body, as I just indicated a few minutes ago. And you're at, in the 1980s, um, there was a, a best-selling book by Dr. Norman Cousins. Mm. And I 
forgetting the exact title right now, but if you Google his name, I'm sure the book will come up. And and he had a, a life threatening illness. And one of the things he did was watch funny movies all day. And he laughed a lot. And doctors were amazed how, that he, he recovered. Anatomy of an illness. Is that it or the biology of hope? I found two. Well, um, I was thinking of anatomy of an in, illness, okay. but, but it sounds like the other one would be re- relevant to, to your listeners as well. And uh, yeah, so what else can I say about the mind-body connection? You can't have one without the other. Mm-hmm. Um, and mind-body, body doesn't just mean what we eat. You know, it's, it's the exercise, it's the quality of the sleep that we have, um, we are biological creatures in a natural world. If if the oceans, the the massive waters of the oceans are influenced by the position of the moon and, you know, the influence that on the tides, not only are we little biological creatures in our universe influenced by that bigger energy shall I say but so we are influenced by the more immediate um, circumstances and biological conditions that we create or experience the air that we breathe the water that we drink the quality food that we eat so I, I've gone a little bit here, there, and around the mulberry bush, Christina. I hope I answered your question. You did. You did. Um, you know, I think it can be a whole other podcast episode. It could probably even be a whole podcast series. Yes. You know, there's so many books out there. Um, you yes. know, it was separate for a really long time. That mind, you know, People thought the mind was different from the body, but there is so much interactions and interplay. And, you know, yes. it's... Yeah. Try, try separating your mind from your body. Yeah, I, I can't. <laughs> I invite any listeners to write in if they can. <laughs> and where and where is the mind anyway? Mm-hmm. Some people have have assumed it's in the brain because the brain is mm-hmm. where we cognitively process. Now they think it could be the gut or the microbiomes influence okay. a lot of mm-hmm. and exactly. just what the Egyptians and so many ancient cultures already knew that. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. It, it's true. You know, in some of those everyday expressions, you know, I've got butterflies in my stomach or yeah. I have a gut feeling. And it, it, you know, that's a, a type of mind as well. And then maybe that gut feeling is translated into words through the brain's cooperation. Mm. <laughs> but um, each one of us, what are we made of? You know, 90% water. What's the water made of plus the other 10% of stuff? Mm-hmm. Cell, cells. What's, what's a, protons, neurons, energy, energy. And the privilege we have as an individual, if we're aware of it, is that we can craft to a huge degree, if we're not cognitively impaired, of course, or have other medical issues, that's Mm. the exception perhaps. But otherwise, we get to create our attitudes. And I'm not talking sugary sweet, it's all for the best when when tragic things yeah. happen. I'm talking about realistic optimism, which really comes back to the theme of your podcast. I'm talking about choosing what we eat and making an effort to sleep enough, except for occasionally where we go a little wild on a happy celebration. Or, you know, we have the responsibility. Mm-hmm choose to use it otherwise let's be victim and blame the society the environment the politics the food the lack of you know let's take control you know it's very empowering and and it 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 feels really good to be in charge of what we can be in charge of which is our thinking and our emotions and our behavior 
Mm. And that's where you say that it is a lifestyle. Yeah. That acceptance. Attitude. An attitude, a way of life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I wrote an article um, that was published a few years ago. I was uh, about gratitude. And um, I was, I'll, I'll make a long story short. Yes, I live in New York City, not far from the Hudson River. And one of my uh, life enhancing activities to, is to go for walks by the Hudson River, which is a bike path, pedestrian path. One day, uh, a bike that was speeding barreled into me and I fell back and, and lost consciousness for a bit and it was a big concussion. Oh, and then when I came to, I sort of sat up and when I, I realised nothing was broken, I was a bit dazed, my head hurt, but I was by and large okay. My first attitude slash emotion was gratitude that it wasn't worse. Now, I attribute that mainly to the fact that for decades up until that point, I had been practicing during hard times, actively looking for what still was good, what I still could be grateful for. And therefore, I wasn't enraged. I was grateful. Now, I still told the bike rider firmly You need to be more careful. You could have killed me. You could have killed yourself. But I wasn't enraged. Hmm. And um, in terms of hope, Mm -hmm. we can focus on what's really rotten. Or as I said earlier, accept that reality, but also make it a daily practice to look at what hope there is for improvement, accept any facts that tell us probably in that regard there's no hope and focus on where there is hope and what we can be grateful for and what still is good. And I think I wrote to you um, last month in, in our email exchange, my parents survived five years of concentration camp. Mm in Europe during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. They were childhood sweethearts who married just before the war and then they were taken to concentration camps and put in separate, first of all, male-female areas, but then they were moved to different concentration camps. And as the years rolled along, each one thought that probably the other one was dead but they clung to the hope that but maybe they aren't. And when the war was over, Mm -hmm. by some fortuitous circumstance or miracle, if you want to call it that, yeah. They found one another. Most of their other family members were murdered, slaughtered, put in gas chambers to die. And each my my mum, my dad, amazing people mm-hmm. would would say they they refused to lose hope, even in hell-ish situations. Yeah. And um, fast forwarding briefly to starting a new life in Australia where, you know, some years later I was born. Mm -hmm. A number of of their friends in Australia were also Holocaust survivors and some of them had what was then called nervous breakdowns. Now we call it GAD, you know, generalised anxiety Mm. disorder or whatever. Panic attacks, yeah. Yeah, and and post traumatic stress. The, yes. In those kids, they didn't have that expression. Yes. And they suffered. But my parents and others of their friends did not suffer from those because more than remembering the the brutal, horrendous past, they focused more on the here and now and what they were grateful for, a new beginning, a new mm. life, a new 
new chance. And um, of course, they cried at times when they remembered their dead family members or, or recalled the whole, but that wasn't their predominant focus. Yeah. So to come back to your beautiful um, theme of your podcast, Hope and Resilience, it's a choice. It's a choice to have hope. It's a choice to be resilient when bad things happen. And what can help us is to think of people who have survived hell and, and clung on to hope and the fact that things did get better and that they did survive. We can recall times where we've survived, proof that, you know, when bad things happen doesn't necessarily mean that they will destroy or diminish us. But it's a choice and it does require ongoing effort. Ongoing, it's a practice. And like you said, that it's daily, that daily gratitude, daily acceptance. Well, Dr. Ellis, I like to ask, you know, speaking of hope, I'd like to ask you a personal question. I do ask this to all everyone that I interview. What brings you hope? Um, what a great question, um, Christina. I, I think it's because it's I choose to have it. <laughs> um, it's because not only, I was, was going to say not only my parents endured brutal uh, situations, but so did I. But the ones I've endured uh, can't be compared to what they did. But I have evidence that things get better that things can get better. I've observed people tunnel down, 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 down and give up on life because they allowed themselves to lose hope. So what gives me hope is my experience that things do get better if I persist and if I continue my practice of daily gratitude what gives me hope is reminding myself that I love being alive. I love life. I hate some of the tragic things. I hate cruelty that happens in war and terrorism. I, I abhor cruelty to animals and the environment. I do what I can as the individual I am to, to if I can't do anything practical, I'll contribute a little to some of the organizations that really are making a difference. And I have a sense I'm not going to live forever. So what gives me hope is that there's so much, even though there's much that's not great, so much that is great, and I can enjoy it, and I can work to maintain my good health and keep enjoying it. And another thing that gives me pleasure and meaning is that I can do my bit to help other people when they're feeling hopeless, to restore their hope. And when that happens, they can help other people restore their hope. And, and that's, you know, doing a little can, can kind of open up into helping a whole lot. You know, one life touches another, another touches another, and there's an exponential growth of people infecting others with hope. Mm -hmm. People infecting others with hope. That's a good infection to have. Well, <sighs> and I don't suggest any vaccine or immunity from that one. Let, let it fester and grow. Yes, yes. Let it spread, you know, because hope, is contagious. And, you know, I have, you know, hopeology and I have hope, stories of hope, healing and resilience. And I have it in that order for a reason. Because when you have hope, then you can heal and then you have that resilience, you know, in that order. And it's, you need hope first. And so thank you so much, you know, for being on here, explaining, you know, the, the history of REBT and how REBT can foster hope, but also sharing, you know, some of your own personal history and how it inspired you to have hope as well. And I just really appreciated or appreciate, excuse me, you being here. So thank you so much. 
Oh, it's a great pleasure, Christina. I really appreciate you and the work you're doing to infect others. Yes. With hope. <laughs> um, so keep up your great work with, with individuals and, and via your podcasts. Um, that's wonderful. And I hope your listeners will, you know, do whatever is required that they heal any wounds that that dampen any hope uh, so that they rekindle hope or give birth to hope and keep that alive and to cherish life mm -hmm. and to help other people yeah really cherish life mm. be that gratitude dr ellis where can people find you online or learn more about you okay thanks for asking well my website is www Debbie Joffe Ellis as one word. And that will be in the show notes for everybody. Great, great, yeah. So don't, I, I caution people sometimes put in three E's instead of two. It's D E double B I E J O double F double E double L I S dot com. And so that's my website, and there are videos and um, gee, I might add this podcast. You know, there are recordings there. There are some articles I've written for Psychology Today and other things. And there's my self-care sheet that we mentioned yes. earlier, which a person can use to help them identify are they thinking in irrational ways and creating unhealthy emotions, and then it guides them into disputing them, the irrational beliefs, coming up with healthy beliefs, that they can repeat and repeat and therefore prevent creating that unhealthy emotion the way they did. So my website, and it also, um, I put on a, any upcoming workshops or presentations and some of the people, if they're in that area, they can attend or listen to if it's a virtual one. And so I, I guess that's one of the best ways to see what I'm doing and and where I might be presenting. And if it's a student, I teach at Columbia University. So come do my REBT course if you're doing a master's or a doctorate in psychology. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you. And yeah, thank you again. And to everyone listening, I um, inspire you to check out her website, look at um, the self care um, sheet. I think that's fabulous. And, you know, I just give hope for all. Me too. Thanks again, Christina. And where there's life, there really is hope till the moment we're not here anymore. Then there's not much hope <laughs> for the individual we're... who's dead. But where there's life, there's hope. Let's cherish life. Yeah. <laughs> where there's life, there's hope. teaches you know all over the world and you know co-wrote a book about REBT with her husband Albert Ellis is someone that walks her talk meaning that not only does she teach it she lives it and I think that's fabulous and we need more people like her that live what they teach live what they believe if you want to learn more about her the um, show notes has her website so please check that out and also just remember, this is a passion project. So please, if you'd like to buy me a coffee, please do so. Information is also in the show notes. And I will see you guys in two weeks.
Thank you for listening to Hopology. If you enjoyed today's show, please leave us a review. To learn more about us or listen to past episodes, you can find us on all your podcast streaming stations. If you are interested in being a guest or if you have any feedback, please email us at hopologypodcast at gmail.com. You can also support our show by clicking on the link in our show notes. Please also follow our Instagram page, Hopology Podcast, and visit our website, www.hopologypodcast.com.